Every person has got a light. Every person has got a light. Look with your heart, see how bright. Every person has got a light, has got a light. Every bird's got a song to sing. Every bird's got a song to sing. Whether grounded or taking wing, every bird's got a song to sing. It's got a song to sing. Every tree takes time to grow. Every tree takes time to grow. If you want a forest, then you should know. Every tree takes time to grow. Takes time to grow. Every person's got a song to sing. Every person's got a song to sing, whether grounded or taking wing. Every person's got a song to sing, it's got a song to sing. being rooted in And one of the, as Liska said, one of the things he named that really helped him to be rooted in joy is relationship. Uh, and he named David Harmon as one of the people that really rooted him in relationship. And it was a relationship of joy. So Joe and David lived at the big house. <laughs> there they are. Um, uh, for, uh, yeah, when everybody lived at the big house in those days, I think it was 1972. And um, of course, David always brought joy to people. He had such a zany sense of humor and 
kind of goofy and Joe was always surprised at what stories David told and the jokes and just by his amazing spirit. Um, and it was a real source of joy for both of them. They loved each other and really grew in friendship and were brothers. And then uh, at the end of the year that Joe was planning to spend at daybreak, he was moving back to Chicago and um, had a little meeting with David. And David, of course, was very sad that Joe was leaving. And he said, brother, I'll really miss you. And gave Joe a little photograph of himself to remember him so that Joe would always remember David. And that really touched Joe. I think it made him cry. Um, and uh, so it was like Joe, David's presence just stayed in his heart. He went back to Chicago, but then he couldn't, he couldn't stay in Chicago and he needed to come back to L'Arche. And it was really because of that beautiful friendship with David that he came back. And so then he continued and that relationship with David was foundational for Joe in his whole journey of L'Arche. And what he shared with us last week is he always kept that little photograph in his wallet. And David would ask him, have you still got my photograph? And yes, indeed, right up. I'm sure he has it still today. So um, it kept him, it held him through difficult times and Joe became the international vice coordinator. He had to travel all over the world, be away from home for weeks at a time, which I know was very difficult for him. And, he also mentioned the precious relationships with Mary and with his three boys, David, Patrick, and Kevin. And he kept photographs of them too with him wherever he went. So it was like those relationships grounded him in joy in the midst of some really challenging times, visiting communities that were in crisis, being at long meetings, bringing together people from the large federation and it just grounded him. Okay, and another relationship that really touched me this week, I saw a picture on Facebook of Tanya. That's the one I saw. Isn't that beautiful? I hope you don't mind me talking about you here, Tanya. <laughs> but I just wanted to say I was touched by that picture. Both of them are so young and having so much fun. So if you can imagine this was Tanya probably about 15 years ago or more, 20, 25, I don't know, before she was married before she had kids and uh, it was a foundational relationship. I think uh, Tracy and Tanya fell in love with each other and became a source of joy for Tanya. And many of you know Tanya, all of you who are living with your families, Tanya has been your main connection with Arsh and with the programs. And she always comes with so much joy and energy. And I think we can guess that at the heart of that joy and energy is this relationship with Tracy, that even 13 years after Tracy's died, it's still what animates Tanya. And it has been a difficult time, especially during the pandemic for the past two years, being on leadership team has been stressful. And yet Tanya is grounded in this relationship. You could say that what we're living now in the pandemic is like the wilderness. So it's good that we're thinking about Jesus today who's, who spent that 40 days in the wilderness. Because if you think about what we're living now, um, it's been the pandemic for two years when we haven't been able to see those people that we love. And it's been a lot of stress, challenges, and then now we're in front of, oh, this weather for one thing, the spring and the icy rain today and the sort of in between snow and slush and maybe the spring's coming. It's a time of sort of longing for new life, but it's not here yet. And then there are also these really upsetting images of the Ukraine and the terrible war that's happening there. So we are living a kind of wilderness experience. So let's look at <clears throat> Jesus and what it was like for him. And maybe he can help us to enter into this time and our own struggles and really lead us forward in this season of Lent that we're just beginning. 
<clears throat> and I think what's really important as we read about Jesus in the wilderness is to realize what happened just before he went into the wilderness. And that was that he was baptized. He went up to John the Baptist at the Jordan River to receive baptism like everybody else. And at that moment, as we read in scripture, the heavens opened and the Father's voice, God's voice was heard saying, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So just imagine that moment of joy, that relationship with the loving Father that just grounded Jesus. That was foundational for his life and for his ministry. It was the beginning of what we say as Jesus' public ministry, where he left his mother and his home in Nazareth, went down to the Jordan, was baptized, and that became the beginning of his ministry, where he went out to talk to people, to heal people, to bring people hope and joy, to tell people about this loving God who he called Father. So right after that, that same spirit that had blessed him, it said it came down in him like a dove. That same spirit drove him into the wilderness. So it was in the wilderness that his relationship that grounded him was really tested. So as we read, the voice of temptation said to him, okay, how are you going to be in the world? You could just turn these rocks into bread. But Jesus resisted the temptation by remembering that relationship with his father. And he said, no, no, we cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He kept coming back to that relationship with his loving God. And then the voice of temptation said to him, well, you could worship me and you'd have all kinds of power and honor and prestige in the world. But Jesus resisted that temptation, again, just coming back to his loving relationship with God, saying, no, scripture says, again, quoting the word of God, you shall love the Lord your God and him alone will you serve. So again, anchoring himself in that relationship that was the source of his joy. Even though in the wilderness that joy wasn't so exuberant, it was this quiet joy, this quiet confidence, this being with the Father. And the third temptation that came to him was, oh, well, I could just jump off this temple and enter the world in a very dramatic way. And then it would be on social media, it would be in all the papers, and people would look up to me and think, wow, here's the Son of God. But no, it wasn't about that. And uh, he went back to scripture when he was faced with that temptation. He said, don't put God to the test. You know, so living his mission as the beloved and helping others to know that they too are the beloved was all about being in that relationship, trusting God, not putting God to the test. So we can see that Jesus has a lot to teach us about being rooted in relationship and rooted in joy. And I, when I think of my own journey in L'Arche, one of the really um, joyful times and really fruitful times, I would say, was, um, it was 1984 when we were opening the meeting hall. The meeting hall was being built and I was asked to help start the day program and we were welcoming Rosie Decker and Adam Arnett. Uh, really exciting times in the community. Um, and Rosie was the person that really touched my heart, um, got under my skin in her, you know, her little coy uh, scooting around and her just the mystery of kind of who she was and how we could kind of connect with her. And in those days, she was quite fearful of people and she scooted away and she didn't like to be held. And there was a whole issues around eating. It was all very challenging. And, uh, but she was like the princess and, and we'd been anticipating her coming. See, for months we were talking about this new project of welcoming, welcoming Rosie and Adam. And so like there, at the beginning of the day program, there was Rose and two and a half assistants just dancing around her. I was just 
trying to figure her out. And, um, and then uh, it was beautiful. I mean, just how she grew and those wonderful glances you would get from Rose that just went right to your heart. Um, and gradually how she opened up and gradually gained weight and was able to have surgery on her esophagus and then gradually stood up and started walking. I mean, it, she was pretty amazing. And then of course there were others in the day program too. Um, Mike Ritchie joined us and Suzanne Cairns and Carol uh, Greg and Janice Byrne. And we, st we started making soup for people to come in and at the day program. So those were wonderful years. And I was living at the big house with uh, John Bloss, Mike Ritchie and Ellen Weinstein and Marianne Brown, it was a big household, Roy Turkel. Um, so life was very full of relationship for me. And, um, and I actually went on a retreat in 1985. It was called a covenant retreat. And I just had this experience like the penny dropped and I realized God is calling me to Larsh. This is where I belong. That was very joyful for me. It gave me a lot of energy. And then the next year, Henry Nowen arrived. It was all very exciting. And then in 1987, in March, I was asked to go to Stratford to go there and be a community leader. So Henry organized this whole uh, mass at the meeting hall. That was before we had the day spring and invited all the people from Lars Stratford to come. So we were two communities um, in the region uh, together for this mass. And then literally I was sent from daybreak off to Stratford. So I went off to Stratford and um, some of the folks came in my car and that was the transition. But I can tell you when I first went to Stratford, it was like a wilderness because I didn't know people. And I'd come from this wonderful richness of relationship at daybreak and being blessed and uh, being with people every day who I loved to being in a place where, gosh, I was in front of this new role being community leader and I had to meet with the board of directors and the people from the government and get to know the core members and assistants. And it was, it was difficult, but what kept me grounded was those relationships of daybreak. And I think Rose was one of those central people. She was foundational for me. So what a power that relationship can give us, it give us real strength and courage to persevere through difficult times. And I know even after a person has died, like so many of our core members now, our saints that we're talking about have died, and yet their, their legacy, the treasure, the gift of those relationships continues. And I know on this Zoom Spring Monday, Call. we've prayed for a lot of people who have died. Sometimes it's a mother or a father or a grandmother or a brother or sister. And the, the thing is, even after the person has died, that person that has loved you continues to be a real strength, eh? And I think what really moved me this week was on Friday, I joined the Zoom call with the Faith and Light people in Ukraine. And it was a beautiful invitation that Trish sent around uh, that any of us are welcome to join this Zoom call and it's happening every day at one o'clock. The Faith and Light and large people in Ukraine are coming together to pray. And apparently it's for 90 minutes every day as much as they can. So I tuned into this call, it was about two o'clock. They'd already been meeting for an hour. And uh, what I saw was so beautiful. So it was on Zoom, the face of this young woman and she was just smiling and she was speaking to this other two people who seemed to be maybe core members from Faith and Light. These two women, uh, no, it was a woman and a man. And obviously she knew them very well. And she was speaking in such an encouraging, smiling way. And they looked kind of afraid and nervous and alone. And she just reached out to them. 
and she actually had behind her a lit candle and a big beautiful picture of a sunflower and they were sort of in the dark but she was reaching out to them in such an encouraging way just always smiling and of course it was in Ukrainian I didn't understand what they were saying but that didn't matter like I really got the message she was speaking into this relationship that they had obviously they spent hours and maybe years together in faith and might building relationship praying together celebrating together and now here they are in this really unimaginable wilderness of their cities being bombed and people are having to flee and there's so much fear and yet here they are rooted in relationship rooted in that joy they've experienced together and just keeping that flame alive and uh, it was beautiful. Zenya was also on the call. There was 122 people on the call when I tuned in from all over the world, from Larsh, from, you know, Slovenia, England, France, Australia, United States. I mean, what beautiful solidarity. And there was Zenya, who, of course, spent over 20 years in Ukraine and had nurtured all of these 25 faith and light communities. She probably knew almost everyone on that call. And there she was. It's like the relationship was rekindled by this call. And that was at the heart of their joy, their hope, their courage to sustain this time of wilderness. And then um, a mother and her son came on and the mother was talking close to the uh, computer and her son was kind of wandering in and out of the doorway kind of listening and she was talking away in Ukrainian and then she said now in English and she sang this beautiful song which of course I've sung also in Faith and Light um, it, it goes like this all night all day angels watching over me my lord all night all day angels watching over me and again, I was really touched by that, just that hope in the midst of the darkness. And it's a song that's gone all around the world. Um, so that really gave me hope. And it really spoke to me about this theme of being rooted in joy through relationship, even in the midst of really challenging times, even in the midst of wilderness. So let's give thanks for those faithful relationships that we have known and that others are witnessing to in our world today.
God of day and God of darkness, now we stand before the night. As the shadows stretch and deepen, come and make our darkness bright. All creation still is groaning for the dawning of your might. When the sun of peace and justice fills the earth with radiant light. You shall be the path that guides us, you the light that in us burns. Shining deep within all people, yours the love that we must learn. For our hearts shall wander restless till they safe to you return. Finding you in one another, we shall all your face discern. Praise to you in day and darkness, you are source and you our end. Praise to you who love and nurture us as a father, mother, friend. Grant us all a peaceful resting. Let each mind and body mend. So we rise refreshed tomorrow, hearts renewed to kingdom tend.